weak pointers. The pointers for those of you who are just not quite strong enough to use proper pointers. Recently I made a video as part of my code review series talking about why this code failed this like test or application that the person submitted it for. And I specifically mentioned that a potential improvement in one area would have been to use weak pointers instead of just raw pointers. Okay, so yeah, the, the way that these observers get registered here is they get the raw pointer from an actual shared pointer. So yes, I'm right in the sense that they are kind of trying to use this, if I can find it, they are trying to use this like a weak pointer. But the problem is it's not that safe because you just have a pointer, you've got a memory address to something that is like you're not owning it, which means it could get deleted and you might still have it. And if you try and access it, like you're accessing freed memory and that would cause a crash. So the way to go here is to look up something called a weak pointer, STD weak pointer. So I thought today we would just kind of sit down, have a bit of a discussion as to what weak pointers are, when it might be a good idea to use them and why. So first of all, what is a weak pointer? When I say weak pointer, I'm specifically talking about STD weak pointer. It's a class included in the C++ standard library and it's specifically designed to be used with shared pointers. So let me show you how it works and what it does. A shared pointer is a wrapper around a raw pointer, in this case of a heap allocated object that is called object. That's the type we're dealing with here. It's a wrapper around that raw pointer that would otherwise be written like this. And the purpose of it is to kind of automate the lifetime management of it. So in the simplest scenario, if we just look at this exact code that we have here, very, very simple. The difference between these two and why we kind of like shared pointer is that this code will result in this object instance being deleted or automatically at the end of this scope. Whereas with obj2, we would manually have to call delete. Now, technically unique pointer would obviously do the same thing. If we did std make unique here instead of make shared, and this was a unique pointer, it would also be deleted at the end of the scope. But the real magic of shared pointer is that we can share it. We can have multiple places inside our program that contain these references to that object. And when all of them are gone, when all of them are out of scope and the actual shared pointer itself gets destroyed, as long as they're all gone, there's none left. At that point, our underlying object instance gets deleted. You can't do that with a unique pointer, obviously, because there can only really be one copy of that. And that's it. It's fantastic for like scopes, but if you have an object that you wanna share around using collections, use outside of like one given function or class instance, then this reference counting system, which simply just maintains a count of how many shared pointer references there are to a given object instance works really well. And so for example, if I introduce this manager struct over here, which as you can see holds an object as a shared pointer, I can share this object that I made here in this scope with this other system that is in its own scope, might have its own lifetime, might do whatever with it. And I know that unless both of these independently die, I'm not going to lose that underlying object instance. So this is just a little bit of a recap. And the reason why I'm going through this is because because these, we kind of just call these references because this is a reference counting system, these shared pointers. But a more specific term for these kinds of references is something called a strong reference. And the reason why this is called a strong reference is because it's basically, it's not just a reference to this object that allows us to use it. It's a reference that is strong enough to actually keep the object alive. Meaning that as long as I keep that reference alive, I'm actually preventing that underlying object instance from dying. Picture that, the power to prevent Prevent something from dying. Ugh, where can I learn this power? Not from a Jedi. I'll tell you where you can learn that power. You can learn that power with Brilliant.org's 30 day free trial. For those of you who don't know, Brilliant.org is an amazing website filled with lots and lots of really high quality courses on various STEM topics. And thanks to their 30 day free trial, you can explore all of these courses for free and see if you like them. If you're just getting into programming, then I highly recommend you take a look at Brilliant's excellent beginner computer science courses. They're really gonna make sure that you have the right frame of mind and teach you how to think like a programmer. And honestly, it's really easy to just pick it up and get learning because all of Brilliant's courses are extremely visual, engaging, and interactive. Instead of just sitting back and watching videos and zoning out, you'll actually have to interact with the teaching material. They'll get you to actually drag things around, build these kind of flow graphs, see visually how everything kind of fits together and works, which is fantastic. And then of course, everybody's favorite subject, math. Brilliant has some of the best math courses I've honestly ever seen. And the reason why is because I just think math is such a beautiful topic to teach visually. It really benefits from like these widgets that you can drag around, especially for the more advanced topics like calculus and getting quizzed every step of the way to 
make sure that you're actually learning and retaining this information really makes for a very powerful learning experience. And as I mentioned, 30 day free trial, just go to brilliant.org slash the channel link will be in the description below. Try it out for yourselves, see if you like it. And if you do go on to like it, Brilliant have been nice enough to offer 20% off an annual premium subscription using that link in the description below. Huge thank you to Brilliant.org as always for sponsoring this video. So back to preventing things from dying. Shared pointers, strong references, they will keep things alive. They're also called an owning reference. That basically just means that they, I guess, take ownership of an object. Ownership, they, they still share ownership. It's not like they are the sole owner. But in this case, by sharing this object with the manager, I'm now saying that this underlying instance won't die until manager also is okay with it dying by, I guess, it dying itself. Lots of dying going on. Welcome to C++. So then what do people usually do if they don't want this ownership kind of owning strong reference? What if I just wanna give manager access to this object, but I'm cool if it dies, like it's fine for it to die. I don't wanna be the one stopping it from dying. It's a little too close of a relationship with this object here. I just wanna be chill. I just wanna be like, you die, it's cool, man. But if you're alive, I might use you. So one way to do this is to simply drop this shared pointer aspect. We could just go back to this being a raw pointer. In that case, we'd have to change this API to basically be dot get like that. So on the actual shared pointer itself, not the object, obviously the shared pointer, we're calling the get function, which just returns the raw pointer. You can see it over here, right? This now means that if this object does in fact die, what does manager have? Just a pointer. And what is that? Just an integer, just a memory address. So obviously this can't do anything to keep that object from dying. It's going to die or it's not going to die. All we are holding is basically like some kind of number, which just says, where is it in memory? Now, hopefully for a lot of you, this already seems like a little bit of a problem because if we are simply holding this number in memory, how do we know if it's safe to use it or not? Because what happens if it has in fact been deleted? We've lost it, he's dead, Jim. What happens if we try and use it in that case? An explosion will happen. And the thing is, the worst part about this is you really can't do anything to actually check that, can you? Because if you could do something like that, well, that would be cool, but that only works if something sets this to null. Right, if I set this to something like this, and actually let's make this a little bit more complicated. Let's maybe put manager up here so it doesn't die. And then what I'm gonna do is put this into a scope. Let's get rid of this as well. So if I take a look at this now, and just to make this even more explicit, let's add a destructor where we'll print deleted object. If I run this program, then you can see the problem. I've deleted the object first, and then what am I doing? I'm able to access that pointer. And obviously all we're doing here is we're actually printing the value of the pointer. We're not accessing the memory at that memory address. We're just simply printing the memory address, which is obviously fine to do in any case. But you can see that it still looks like a valid memory address, which means that this code will run fine. The only way in this case to get around that would be if we explicitly, after deleting it, actually set that to null. But like. We don't even know if we're gonna delete it here, do we? We have no idea because something else might also have a shared pointer of that object because we can share it around. So we've kind of created this like impossible situation here where we have no way of ever knowing when that shared pointer is completely gone, deleted, just disappeared. And instead we're left with a situation where we have a raw pointer that is always going to have a seemingly valid memory address that is just really a time bomb waiting to just crash and destroy our program. So what can we do instead of using a raw pointer here? Since clearly that's not gonna work out too well. That is where weak pointers come in. They are, you can think of them as shared pointers cause I wanna share stuff with you, but I don't want you to own it. So I'm not creating a strong reference here to an object. I'm creating a weak reference. They're really quite powerful, like from a kind of semantics point of view and they're super easy to use. So if we transform this into using weak pointers instead of a raw pointer here, we would simply have std weak pointer. The type obviously, we can get rid of this. Over here, instead of obj.get, we simply assign this to the shared pointer itself because weak pointer has a constructor that takes in a shared pointer. And then the last piece of the puzzle here is how do I do my little safety check? Well, there's a couple ways. The best way to probably rewrite this specific code is to write something like auto obj equals obj.lock. And then over here, you can just, you know, 
use your object as normal if that succeeds. Otherwise, you cannot. So what actually happens over here? Because I've written auto here, which can be a little bit hiding what's actually going on. What happens when we call this lock function is you can see it actually returns a shared pointer of that object. So we're kind of converting this weak pointer back into a shared pointer. Why? Because if we need to use the object, suddenly we do want a strong reference, don't we? Because if we don't maintain a strong reference, then a lot can actually change between this line of code and this line of code, right? If we just had, for example, a, I don't know, like an object pointer like this, then something in between these two lines could actually delete the underlying object. Why? Well, because multi-threading exists, right? Some other thread might be the last thing actually holding on to a shared pointer to that strong reference. It might release it. Everything looks good at line 15. Line 17, when we try and use it, suddenly, oh, actually, sorry, it's not valid anymore. So what this does instead is it has a shared pointer. It gives us a shared pointer of that weak pointer object. And now for this entire scope, because we've got a shared point now, it will keep this object alive, even if nothing else does. So that, of course, is really, really important. And of course, since lock gives us a shared pointer that is obviously capable of dying and thus unlocking the object, we don't have to like manually call unlock or anything like that. All it does is it gives us a strong reference that we can do whatever with for whatever kind of duration we need to. Now, if you just want to check though, whether or not it's valid, you can instead call the expired function and that will just basically tell you whether or not that object has been deleted. So if you don't necessarily need to use it, but you just want to check to see if it's still alive, you can. And then finally, this other thing that I like is there's a function here called use count. And that's kind of cool because what that does is it actually gives you the reference count. So you can see in how many places in your program are you actually holding a strong reference to this object. So in this case, because we only have one shared pointer over here, if we call this function before that shared pointer actually dies, I'd expect it to say one. In fact, we can try that by calling this function multiple times. And then you can see we have one first, then deleted object, and then zero. So I guess technically if you wanted to, you could also write something like that as well. So hopefully that sheds a little bit of light as to what weak pointers are and where it's just a really good convenient idea to use them. Obviously there is some overhead added to this system versus just using raw pointers. So it's not necessarily a situation where you should go through and replace every single raw pointer you have that's made from like a shared pointer or something and just replace it with a weak pointer. But the thing is, it's one of those like overheads that's like, well, what about using smart pointers in the first place? Like unique pointer, does that have a bit of overhead? I mean, unique pointer really doesn't, but like shared pointer has a bit of overhead. So should I not use shared pointers? Should I not use reference counting? Well, it's just one of those situations where there's no other choice in some cases than to use say reference counting or weak pointers. And in my opinion, in most cases, the overhead is so negligible that I would probably just use weak pointers. One use case that I can think of where like literally it's mandatory to use them, otherwise it won't work, is when you have like a cyclical dependency. So if you have object A having a shared pointer to object B, and object B having a shared pointer to object A, they will never die because there's always going to be something holding that object. So like, for example, take a look at this program. We have a struct called A and a struct called B. They have shared pointers pointing to each other. Here we have A and B, you can see they're kind of wired up like this. If I run this program, check this out. There's nothing being destroyed. We create these objects, but where at the end of the scope, they don't get destroyed. But if we go over here to this one, for example, and we make B have a weak pointer of A instead of a strong pointer, then suddenly they're both destroyed at the end of the scope. So this is an example in which maybe we want both objects to have like a reference to each other, which again is perfectly valid. We might need to do work, you know, they might need to do work together, but you have to be careful with strong references in this case. And now finally, let's take a look at that kind of real world example that we had from the code review that I did in the last video that I talked about, where specifically you can see we had like this input handler, which allowed us to register an observer. And you can see it takes in a raw pointer. And where does that come from? That comes from, you know, game switch state, for example, where it actually takes current state, which is a shared pointer and calls dot get on it to get the raw pointer. And then that gets put into like register observer, for example. So how can we rewrite the systems use weak pointers instead and thus not just blindly 
you know, like iterate through all of these observers as raw pointers, not knowing if they're even still there or not. Well, over here inside the input handler, we have a vector and you can see the vector has raw pointers. So instead we can just change that to be a weak pointer like this. And then all of these same exact scenario, you can just pass these in by value like that. It's totally okay to just copy weak pointer instances like this. Let me just go to these definitions and make sure that I've also got them set up like this. And then when iterating through this, this is where we have the option to actually do that safety checking that I was talking about. So to simplify this, we could just call this auto observer like that. And then before using it, we could lock it, right? So maybe I'll do something like obs like that equals observer.lock. And then if that succeeds, I could go ahead and actually call on mouse left click on that observer. Otherwise, if it isn't valid anymore, it might make sense to just remove it as an observer so that I don't have to keep iterating through it, obviously, because it's been deleted. So in that case, I might just want to call remove observer with that specific observer. Now, if you really want to make sure this code was a bit more solid as well, obviously it's possible to register an observer that is an invalid weak pointer in the first place. It might just be null. In that case, you, you'll just end up removing it, I guess, instantly. It should probably be okay, but that might be worth checking if you care. And then over here, we have the same kind of situation, but for a quit event. Again, I would probably just make this auto observer. And then if the locking succeeds, I can call that function and that's it. So that would be like the safer way, I guess, to deal with these observers if you didn't want to necessarily risk, I guess, them dying outside of this since we don't actually hold strong references to them inside this class. To those of you watching, would you change the code to what I changed it to or would you keep it as is with the raw pointers. Let me know why in the comment section below. But otherwise, I hope you guys enjoyed this video on weak pointers. Let me know what your thoughts are in general as well with using them. Like how often do you actually use weak pointers? How often do you see other people use weak pointers? And are you for them? Are you against them? Do you think they overcomplicate things? I don't personally think it's necessarily a debate of whether or not they're useful. Of course they're useful. It's more about like how much do you actually use them? Because I mean, inside Hazel, for example, we don't actually use shared pointers. We have our own reference counting system. That's probably a topic for another video. And we with that custom reference scanning system in Hazel, weak pointers do exist. And to be honest, they're super useful for things like debugging. A lot of the times you might want to kind of almost have a view into something because you just want to keep track of it so that you can like display it in the UI as like some list of like alive references you have of like all images, for example, inside Vulkan. But then because you're kind of just an observer, of that debug information that you care about. You obviously don't wanna keep it alive. You just wanna have it around if it's valid. If it's not, it's cool. But if it's valid, let me keep that around so that I can then pull stuff from it if I need to. So for situations like that, I find that it's super useful. Anyway, thank you guys for watching. I will see you next time. Goodbye.